from across the seas I came, out of the land of the Orient Pearl. To this land of immigrants, they say, yet seeking not its comforts, more than union with my beloved. I am in limbo among loyalties fading, identity hovering midst the mis identity hovering midst the misty recollections of the soul, and I find I am among the first of many yet to become. I feel beholden not to, to any sovereign, save none but humanity itself. I'm a citizen of the world, a child of humankind. Do they not recognize their own? I feel beholden not to any color or creed. Do they not realize the truth that people are no longer to be separated? by time or space, by religion or class, by sexual orientation, by laws and jurisdictions. The divisions among us are illusory as darkness and we continue to walk the earth as wandering strangers till we find ourselves home at each other's heart. the INS immigration process, which succinctly I can describe as a conundrum wrapped around itself. I discovered by undergoing this process that in America, one's status as a human being corresponded with one's status in the immigration process. An immigrant is presumed guilty until proven innocent. Meaning, the closer you approach getting a green card, or better yet, the less guilty you were, and the closer you became a naturalized US citizen, which I am, the greater respect you're shown by US INS agents and interviewers. This respect likewise translated into the physical space in which the corresponding interviews were conducted, depending on what stage of the immigration process you belonged. So I progressed from a hot big warehouse facility in Texas where hundreds of immigrants were herded like cattle with no in-house restroom facilities and so you had to go out of the building to find a restroom but you dare not, you dared not because you will lose your place in line and then you'd have to start at the back of the line again. We only had hardwood benches with no back crests and as seats. Two later on when I became closer to the citizenship process, being approved that is, we had an air-conditioned room, voila! You know, there were just a few of us with padded and upholstered seats and a magazine rack, wow! So that you could kind of read something while you're waiting your turn and best of all, a bathroom nearby. Well, that poem evokes my frustration with the U.S. immigration process, which, cer which certainly deserves to be overhauled. And there are horror stories of families being separated for decades. As far as I remember, at the time that I was engaged to Steve, it took five to six years to get a fiancé visa and that meant not seeing each other possibly during all those years. Uh, five to 10 years to get a parent, 15 to 20 years to get a sibling, and around the same time of five to 10 years to get if you had children in the Philippines. The times may have improved a bit, but I doubt it. So before anything else, I'd like to thank Judy, and Amy and the Iowa International Center for having me today. And I want to thank you, you for choosing to be with us today and for choosing to listen to me 
despite the many burning issues out there, and literally they are burning, aren't they? So, let me start with one of the main areas of our interest today, literature. Early in life, I was fortunate to have the muse call me through the songs of early literary masters, primarily American masters. That was me at six years old reciting a visit from St. Nicholas before my grandfather and our whole clan on Christmas Day. Me at 12 years old reciting Oh Captain My Captain by Walt Whitman for which I won first place in my category that is. And that was me delivering my valedictory address in a high school in the Philippines and citing Be the Best of Whatever You Are by Douglas Malak. You see, I was fortunate because I was privileged to have a very diverse literary education in my small Philippine high school. And my literary roadmaps I can hum humbly share, covered a more expansive terrain compared to the monolithic program provided by the average United States school curriculum, I'd imagine. I know because my I check my children's literature curriculum. For instance, we read the Rubaiyat of Omar Kayam as early as my junior high school year in my small high school. This was the catalyst that got me interested in other literary traditions, such as those of the Persians, the Russians, and Japanese, the Chinese, in addition to the works of American and British masters, that along with the works of our Filipino maestros, formed the foundation of our literature curriculum. It struck me thus as both comical and tragic. When some of my students in a community college I used to teach in, mistook the Rubaiyat as the name for a new Islamic terrorist group and Omar Kayam as another wanted Al-Qaeda leader. The immigrant writer. Truly a microcosm of the larger immigrant experience. For the circumstances and fate of the immigrant writer is no different from the circumstances and fate of the immigrant group from which she arose. It inspired me to write this little poem called People's Poet. You cry to me, hope, hope, give us hope that you would give anything for a sputter of meaning to your lives. I'm sorry to disappoint. A poet rises no higher than her source. So I write two, three, four page long poems and I write itty bitty ones like those. Let me expound this further by showing a few parallelisms between the immigrants and the immigrant writer's experience. Immigrants had to leave all that was familiar and dear to them, often under duress. It's not often, I would say, a matter of choice. Even if they weren't refugees, most of them are forced to leave their native lands in search of a better life, in search of health, safety, and security. Very basic human needs. It's the same most often for the immigrant writer. Immigrants have to reinvent themselves from scratch in adopted country. Why? Because they may have left a previous profession like I did and by circumstances have to adapt themselves to their new circumstances in their adopted country. 
is the same for the immigrant writer. And because you have to redefine yourself after you take on a new job or a profession, and most people, I think, do define themselves by what they do, they also have to redefine their individual and national identities. Who are we? Who am I in this new country? It's the same for the immigrant writer. This inspired me to write a poem called Diaspora of Luz Viminda's Children. This poem contains the name Luz Viminda. It's actually a metaphorical name for the Philippines. Why? Because it contains the first syllables of the names of the three major islands of the country, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So Luz Viminda. So Luz Viminda's children are the Filipinos. So it goes. NVM Gonzalez said, and NVM Gonzalez is a known Philippine writer, how could you return to the homeland if you never left it? Say this to Luz Viminda's children, scattered o'er the earth, tending to lands and children of their masters, the engineer turned oil field worker, the teacher turned nanny, the nurse turned nursing home aide, the wife and mother turned housekeeper, the doctor turned medical clerk, the dancer turned stripper, the singer turned cook, the cook turned dishwasher, the writer turned waiter, the accountant turned bank teller, the lawyer turned paralegal, the professor turned tutor, the soldier turned postal worker, the architect turned construction hand, the best and brightest of Luz Viminda's children turned into masses of struggling humanity, all exiles from motherland and family. I see my brother's face on the waiter who served my dinner, my sister's smile on the bank teller who processed my check, my mother's hands on the nanny that walk her charge in a stroller as I jog past them this morning, my father's brow on the gardener who mows my lawn and clips my hedges. I see myself in the oil field worker and the nanny, the nursing home aide and the housekeeper, the medical clerk and the stripper, the cook and the dishwasher, the waiter and the bank teller, the paralegal and the tutor, the postal worker and the construction hand. I was among the best and brightest of Luz Viminda's children, now wandering in this foreign land, an exile from motherland and family. Yes, I am she, and he, and the little one, all orphaned by this diaspora. No travesty is greater than our families and nations interrupted, but we move on, as life always does, with impunity. We have no time to wallow in misery, to debate if we're human because we live in the shadows, whether we're slaves because we do work others are ashamed to do for slave wages, whether we're criminals because we have no papers to show our right to live and work in this land. Geographical borders are man's creation, not God's. Life is. And this is all we want, to live. My observation has been that we Americans have short and fickle attention spans. Unless a country and its people are currently immediately crucial to U.S. economic and political interests, there is very little interest in news or creative work from those countries and peoples. This further mar marginalizes certain immigrant gr groups. And so, immigrants have to struggle for acceptance in their adopted country as is for the immigrant writer. Immigrants have to persevere and fight systemic, and I say systemic, prejudice and intolerance. It's the same way for the immigrant writer.
point that after 20 years in the US, it appears I've accumulated 20 years worth of poetry. That individually have been published elsewhere, but there were poems that didn't quite fit the mold of American publishing. So I wanted to collate them all in a book, which is this book. I'll tell you the story of how got, this got published. But then, so I had this manuscript, right? And the question stared me in the eye. I've written a book, so what now? How to publish this poetry collection? Why? Because after 20 years of writing and attempting to market my work, I did face those challenges to my voice and to my style. And it inevitably raised questions of identity. I mean, where am I going to place my work within this realm of American literature? Can it find a home? Can it find a niche here? Fortunately for me, at about the same time I was mulling those questions, a publisher, one of the major literary publishers, Black Lawrence Press, um, gave out a call for submissions to essays for an anthology which they wanted to call Others Will Enter the Gates. Immigrant Poets and Poetry, Influences and Writing in America. So they asked us submit, us, submit us your essays on these questions, your influences to your work, you know, what it means to be a poet for you in America, how your work fits within the American poetic tradition, and how work fits within the poetic tradition in your country. And I thought, Maybe I should answer this call, if only as an exercise to answering my own questions about myself as a writer in America. How convenient that call for submissions was. For the first challenge to writers, I'd say, whether immigrant or not, is the question of identity. Who am I as a writer in the United States? As in all big questions, I found I had to start from the beginning. And my beginning was this. Like my native country and people, I am, as my poem, A Letter to My Mother, describes, always seemingly caught between worlds, neither here nor there, neither this nor that, eluding tidy description, belonging nowhere. I was astounded to realize I was no different after all from the riddle within a riddle of a poem that I'd long rebelled against. It also brings up questions of who is the American writer? Why? Because you're forced to conform, you're forced to blend in. And it led me into reflecting and contemplating and in the end I concluded that perhaps being American is a confluence of many factors, such as but not limited to place, therefore writing in America is not by itself uh, a, a criterion to becoming an American writer. Nationality, why? Because you can be in America, yet your culture prevents you from identifying with American culture. And conviction. Why? Because we have Americans who still do not understand what government for the people, by the people, of the people mean. So it's more like the alchemy of parts instead of the mathematical sum of that, those parts that produces an identity that can only be fulfilled in consciousness of being instead of mere legal status. I surmise that similar notions inspired the DREAM Act, for example. Lack of visas and passports certainly do not prevent children of insufficiently documented immigrants who were raised in this country to see themselves as American. So it is the same for the American writer. Where am I going with my writing inevitably compels the question, why do I write? For whom do I write? Well, as a short answer, I'd say, I write because I have to, but more on that later. So consciousness as identity 
is that challenge that stared me in the eye. It begs to ask how is it this all questioning of identity worthwhile? Meaning, how does the question of writer's identity even matter to one's writing? Write what you know is what writing teachers tell the beginners among us. But if I only need to write what I know, then why does it matter whether or not I am conscious of my identity as a writer? Should not my identity simply follow as a matter of course from the substance of my writing? Or does my awareness of my identity as a writer subjectively affect the objectivity of my writing? I say your consciousness, your awareness of your identity in whatever thing you do is important. In my case as a writer, I think it influences my writing approach, my process, and my content. It determines my voice, my style, and preferred themes. And it's also very relevant to my target market. Being an artist, one has to be pragmatic also. One has to be able to identify an identifiable market for your work. That's just the way it is. So who am I as a writer? Well, am I an American writer? I doubt it, for I came to this country already steeped in the diverse literary traditions of my native land. Since I'm Asian, I come from Southeast Asia, can you call me then an Asian American writer? Well, that's what's funny because Asians would balk at the categorization of Filipinos as Asians because our language and worldview are distinctly Western oriented. Owing to 350 years of Spanish colonization that saw my grandparents raised and become Spanish speaking Catholics, and 50 years of American occupation that educated my parents in English speaking classrooms. Am I a Filipino-American writer then? Well, so this is the cinch. What does this term Filipino-American mean? Am I equally Filipino as I am American? Or more Filipino than American? Or vice versa? I admit I have always preferred to write in English. Proof perhaps for my fellow Philippine writers that I'm merely a neo-colonial agent. Indeed, I struggle to write even a half decent sentence in Filipino these days. After 20 years in the United States, I tend to forget how to say things in my native tongue. Tripping over the words and comically inventing vocabulary that sound like terms I can't momentarily recover from the part of my brain that stores the tapestry of my multilingual memory containing names for concepts and feelings the English language hasn't even begun to dream of. Pity for the best I seem to be able to achieve these days after I employ my native tongue is a resulting harder accent on my English speak that immediately betrays the last encounter I've had. My American husband and children are quick to note this when it happens and tease me accordingly. You've been chatting with Filipinos again, haven't you, mom? I'm surprised at how this hits me with a fleeting sense of guilt, as if I've committed a crime, as if somehow speaking my native language has taken from my powers as an English speaking and writing creature. I do know that I think, speak, and write better in English than in any other language in my waking hours. And yet, the sentiments and ruminations in my writing as Filipino as Pinoy spaghetti. What is that, you might ask? This is how I describe it. 
It's the Filipinized version of an already Americanized interpretation of a European pasta dish that, if the writer who called himself Marco Polo is to be believed, was in turn inspired by Chinese noodles. <laughs> Savor that. And so, Filipino-American? By all means. For it's the less complicated evil, you see. In seeking to blend one's work with American literature, with the body of American literature, one really has to ask then, especially if you're a poet, what is American poetry? My answer, simply proposed in my essay is this. American poetry is what is published by its gatekeepers. And that is why it is crucial to examine the criteria by which the gatekeepers decide what or who gets to be published. So you might ask, who are the gatekeepers? They're the literary elite composed of your ivory tower elite, MFA programs and their directors, professors, graduates and their allied university presses and literary journals, your medium and small not so independent presses because they're allied with the first one, and of course your big publishing houses like Penguin Random and Norton. But so, is there a problem here? In the recent American Writers and Writing Program conference I attended in Minneapolis, there were beginning concerns expressed about the extreme professionalization of the writing industry. Why? Because they feared it could result in the homogenization of writing and publishing. For me, the issue raises the issue of institutional patronage to the gatekeepers of American poetry. These literary guardians may deny it all at one, all they want, but, they, but it appears to me that contemporary mainstream American poetry is mainly an insular art form. Its patronage continues to be dominated, if not monopolized, by a small elitist circle cultivated by the nepotistic system between master of fine arts students, graduates, and professors on the one hand, and their university, university presses and allied literary journals on the other. Right away, one could see the acute challenges this presents to the immigrant poet especially one who is probably reinventing herself, like myself, from a career in an entirely different field that she'd pursued in her native country, who is mainly self-taught in the literary arts, meaning she didn't spend the 50 to $100,000 cost of tuition plus living expenses to obtain an MFA in writing or poetry and thus could easily be spotted as an outsider by the American literary elite. The immigrant writer's sense of isolation and alienation is further compounded by her multicultural literary influences. For the effect of such diverse traditions on the writer, I believe, is nothing less than to affect voice and style that, I suspect, are sometimes mistaken by the gatekeepers who may not be familiar with other writing traditions and styles or are simply not accepting of them for lack of artistic merit and integrity. So, to give you an example, let's go into examining a little bit of what poetry do the, do the gatekeepers like to publish. Simply, their poems that are a maze of riddles within a riddle written by poets enamored with their intellects. You know, a Canadian press summed it the best. It said, people don't care for poetry because poetry doesn't care for people. 
had to take a Canadian press to see that truth. And I can't tell you how many people have come to me very shyly, you know, looking over my book and saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so intimidated by poetry. Poetry makes me feel stupid. It shouldn't be the case. Because where did poetry come from? It came from poets and troubadours who lived with the common folk and wrote stories about them. Poetry has traditionally been for the people, by the people, and of the people. And this is the kind of poetry I aim for. So please, today, I ask you to join me in a little revolution in the literary world. Help me in advocating for and supporting accessible poetry. I hope you're with me. Let's give a little more demonstration to make it more concrete. Uh, now, I suppose some of you know about Tiananmen Square, right? The most vivid images of Tiananmen Square to me in 1989 were of military tanks driving down Tiananmen Square undeterred by human beings in their way. write a poem about Tiananmen Square that goes like this. Steady wear of metal wheels, punctuated by cobbled gaps, press on steadfast path, leaving red coats in their dust. Or you may write a poem that goes, come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Which do you think would American publishers want to publish? I say it's that one. And which do you th and this would be what the reading masses and immigrants would probably most appreciate. It's more visceral. It's in the blood, right? Guess who wrote the first one? Well, I wrote it as a way to demonstrate my point. But this was written by the great Pablo Neruda, the great Chilean poet of the 70s, the poet of the Chilean people. So, to me, if you compare this, the difference is not whether one is inferior and the other superior. The difference is in voice and style that can be likened to how one might prefer cool jazz and another likes hot salsa instead. And today being Cinco de Mayo, I can imagine how that resonates in some of you. For me, it's no less, yet no more, than a difference in cultural and philosophical temperament. And so, as you can see from the previous demonstration, I am actually capable of blending in, so I develop a few gate-crashing tools myself. Remember that story that Judy told you I won first place in the first time I entered a writing contest? You know what I did? I pretended to be her. Yes, I pretended to be a Caucasian woman. I adopted her point of view, or POV, as we say among writers. And so, is the moral of the story then to be a chameleon? You know, I remember when I won that contest, I read the other winning pieces, the second and third placer. And the third placer piece was written, obviously, by a Hispanic immigrant who was talking about this, who was telling us this story about a coyote who was smuggling Mexican immigrants from the hot deserts of Mexico into uh, Texas. And I said, I remember that moment I said, I wish I had written this story. 
yet it was mine that won. It was entitled Portrait of the Other Lady. And the final judge of the contest, who was an editor of a major Los Angeles newspaper, said mine won because he said, hands down, he saw it as the most superior. I'm tickled to recall this because, like I said, it was the first time I entered a contest. But he said that he particularly liked how I masterfully crafted the plot development so that the reader could not have guessed the climactic, justified ending, all in 10 pages, double space. So, of course, I was flattered by that. But then, now I ask myself, how long do I have to keep this? doing this, being a chameleon, trying to blend in, trying to conform. And so I said, no, I can't keep this up. If I'm to be a writer, I have to be true to myself. I have to write about things that are dear and precious to me. This inevitably leads a writer to face the ch second challenge. And this is the second challenge, the philosophical foundations of your identity. This g goes beyond identity. And my theory is this, that a person's material conditions, socioeconomic, political, not only affect but determine his or her philosophy, outlook, and attitude. This is nothing new. Being the political science degree holder that I am, I merely ad adopted a, po a political theory to writing theory. And most psychologists would also agree, I would presume, that your material circumstances in life really do determine your approach in life. So my first premise is this. Contemporary mainstream American writing and literature still draw their dominant voice, substance, and style from their Anglo-Saxon roots, along with their underlying philosophical foundation that appears in the last century to have been keenly informed by the existentialist postmodern movement that arose from the maturation of the capitalist industrial state. As some of you may know, the existentialist philosophy is a modern philosophical movement that sees the individual as a free agent in a deterministic and seemingly meaningless universe. So my second premise from this is many immigrant writers coming from different social, political, economic environments that have only begun to follow the early developmental stages of the modern Western state do not share this worldview. Therefore, the question arises whether an underlying bias for a certain philosophical orientation may in fact be determinative of literary style and institutional patronage. And if it does, then what happens to writing whose philosophical foundations do not conform to this qualifying framework? raises a couple of corollary philosophical issues as well. For instance, should poetry merely describe the human condition, rigidly committed to pointing out nothing more than the meaninglessness and absurdity of human life? Or should it aspire to offer more, something else, something that threads upon the finely textured gray zones between the black and white world of art for art's sake and the world that hangs on to, borrowing the words of President Obama, the audacity of hope. For me, the ultimate value of poetry and other forms of creative writing lies not in the mere exposition of the existential human condition, but in facilitating man's search for meaning. In this, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, shows its lasting impression upon me since I read it in Psychology 101. At the core of his book, Frankel expounds that man's primary motivational force is his search for meaning. That man could withstand anything as long as he could somehow assign some value or significance to his life. 
And this is especially crucial for the immigrants' experience. Around the world, people in all walks of life continue to struggle to make sense of their lives, especially those driven from their homeland. And along with this, much of what is familiar and dear to them, they lose their homeland. Immigrants struggle to recreate and redefine their individual and social identities in their new environments, sometimes in the face of much persecution and discrimination. Their struggle is compounded by the immediate material necessity of establishing viable means of livelihood to provide for themselves and their families, often to just keep body and soul together. It is in the midst of such great suffering that many immigrants might question the purpose of their struggle until they are reminded of the soulful aspect of their exile, their desire to support their loved ones, many of, him, of whom are still back home in the motherland, desperately relying on them for their most basic necessities. I find that it is in such moments, these dark nights of the soul, that the power of poetry to soothe, heal, and enlighten is most potent and thus needed. The literary masterpieces that stand out to me in this regard are those of writers and poets who seem to have been successful in decoding some aspect of the great mystery of life and have left their work as maps to help us navigate a meaningful path to a way of living and being that aims far beyond mere existence. Like everything that aspires to greatness, Poetry has the puissance to allow us to glimpse the best and worst versions of ourselves. In exploring the freedoms offered by this immense power, I find a couple of principles in fiction writing, because I do write fiction too, very helpful. First, a writer must depict how the main character has evolved by the end of the story. In poetry, I, the author, am the first to be changed by the exercise of the creative process itself. But equally important to me is the reader or listener who, I hope, is also moved, if not changed, by the experience. Yet, how can I move my reader if he can barely understand what I'm saying? Thus, along with self-expression, I aspire to be understood first and foremost. Second, I strive to write poems that suggest a glimmer of hope, no matter how faint, to sustain the readers and perhaps more importantly, my own faith in human nature. In so doing, I know I'm going against the grain of mainstream American poetry, for I am allowing myself and my work to become vulnerable to criticisms of being sentimental by the gatekeepers who seem to worship absolute detachment as the ideal standard of writing discipline and aesthetic. So I've learned to be a gate crasher. Essentially learning ways and means to assimilate myself by crashing the gates of the US literary world. And I realize that someone else, another great poet, for me one of the greatest American poets of all, showed me the way already. Can you guess? Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman resorted to self-publishing in order to give us his leaves of grass. Can you imagine if he allowed himself to be in despair? Because his poetry was free form. He started the revolution of free verse. And at that time, people were still used to the Victorian formal structural poems. And so they didn't understand this new poetry that's coming from this guy, you know, whose sexual orientation was also suspect, right? So what did he do? Put together all his savings and self-published. But he self-published and I self-publish 
with a view to avoiding vanity publishing. Why? Because he joined groups of fellow poets to which he presented his work for critique, just as I had presented my work to fellow writers for critiquing. And that's what I would plead with my fellow self-publisher, to please not to resort to self-publishing just because you can afford to. Help protect the industry and do subject your work to independent critiquing. Fortunately for my book, and this was part of the integrity of the book that I was very keen on. I, it was loved by a major in, independent book reviewer, Kirkus. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. An immigrant poet in the United States in the end, I've concluded, becomes an American writer by the same process of being. To the same extent she is empowered to assimilate herself in the culture and literary traditions of this nation of many nations and witnesses her work likewise embraced and owned by the larger body of literature identified as American. So after I self-published my book, the year after a major US publisher said, we love your essay, we love your reflections on being an, an immigrant writer in the United States, and could we please have it in our anthology, and do not please submit it to anyone else. Well, I said, I'll try not to submit it to anyone else. But the truth was, I was so humbled, because I was the fluke. When I saw who else was published in this anthology, this book here, they are some of the greatest poets and writers in American literary world. And so, I guess I was lucky. Like I said before, the circumstances and fate of the immigrant poet is no different after all from the circumstances and fate of the immigrant group from which she arose. And sometimes it takes the visionary literary patron, thus we need them, literary patrons and library patrons, taking a stand in the form of a vision such as Black Lawrence Press to open those gates to immigrant writers like me. And that was me during the recent AWP conference in Minneapolis where they launched the book uh, that contains my essay. And that's, uh, those are my publishers. Young, vibrant people that I love. In the end, there is one inescapable vocation of the immigrant writer. And that is narrative urgency. What do I mean by this? The immigrant writer is an accidental prophet. By virtue of her writing, she becomes a symbol whether she likes it or not for her people, the inevitable spokesperson. Thus, to tell the stories of the struggles and concerns of her people, she has to tell the truth also. But in doing so, she has to tell the truth of both good and bad about her people. So therefore, sometimes the prejudice that she experiences comes for, from her own people. A prophet is never welcome in her own village. Remember that? Especially when she speaks the truth about them. Thus, the lack of acceptance cuts both ways, on, from both edges of the knife, from her adopted people and from her own people. Nevertheless, we immigrant writers have an important calling. Every writer evolves at some point. If one were to be a writer of true substance and note, into a citizen of the world and child of humanity, I believe that all great writing aspires to achieve an essential universal quality that I think the immigrant writer who traverses multiple worlds, transcends their boundaries, and successfully transcribes the individual human condition into the annals of humanity's common heritage and legacy, is especially privileged to envision and thus achieve. So for me, 
take this at this moment in time is my narrative urgency call. The still unresolved human rights issue of Philippine comfort women. This is a Filipino Spanish house, a big house. It's a mansion, considered a mansion, that was used as a Japanese garrison in World War II Philippines. This is one of the still surviving comfort women who's fighting for justice still. And these are the few that remain. Out of the thousand known, and this is just the known, former comfort women, only 70 survive. And most of them are sick and dying or senile. And why do I say this is still an unresolved human rights issue? The comfort women issue remains without just and satisfactory closure to this day because the Japanese government has refused and still refuses to officially and legally accept responsibility for the human rights violations and abuses the Japanese Imperial Army committed against these women during World War II. Let me explain a bit about this comfort women system. When the Japanese Imperial Army invaded the Pacific and occupied the various countries, and they occupied China, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Korea, most of the comfort women come from Korea by 80, for, I think 85% of them came from Korea. Um, there were even some Dutch women in the group, perhaps because they were found at uh, Dutch colonies in Southeast Asia. Um, so, when the Imperial Army came, some bright guy, a general in the army, figured we should institute a Jugun Yanfu system. What does Jugun Yanfu mean? Jugun Yanfu means a way for women volunteers to be conscripted by the army. And so the way they explained the system was, it sounded quite benign. They said that in order to avoid the spontaneous acts of rape in the battlefields, the spontaneous acts of rapes which their soldiers are sometimes forced to commit because of the stresses of wartime, then we should just institute a system where our soldiers can regularly gain comfort from a woman. And we will get volunteers from you local inhabitants. And so they said, if you come work for us, we will pay you and we will feed your families. Well, the women, mostly, they weren't women. They were really girls, 13, 14 years old. They were told that they're going to work in factories or in the fields, and in return, their families are going to be given sacks of rice. And so mo most of them were misled into volunteering only to find out later, too late for them, it wasn't the work that they signed up for. Some of them were kidnapped and abducted. Some of them were prisoners of war, the women who joined the resistance movement, who joined the Filipino guerrilla fighters who fought alongside the Americans and kept the Americans, some of them safe, and paved the way for MacArthur to return to the Philippines again. Now, I don't think it's going to be fair if I don't mention that the Japanese, in fact, have provided for a way to apologize and to compensate these women. The big difference is this. They were all private expressions of apologies, and a private fund called the Asian Women's Fund was instituted by them to get private donors in order to compensate some of these women. And when I computed what they gave the women, it amounted to around $26,000 per woman, which is the cost of a pickup truck in the Philippines. Now, that's not to complain of what was generously given, certainly. However, this is the big difference. And let me provide a context. Compare 
to Japan, Germany instituted a public government fund to compensate the victims of the Holocaust. And not only that, Germany owned up to what they did. Their government publicly apologized in behalf of the whole German people, in behalf of their government. The apology given to Filipino comfort women, women were private letters of apology from the prime minister as an individual. Now why is this? Now this is where my being a lawyer comes into usefulness. Well, let me explain a little bit about international law. You see, the United States was complicit in this. Why? Because at the end of World War II, in order to just move on and just forget this horrendous cataclysmic period in human history, and in order to help Japan rise from the ashes of the bombs that it, right, it dropped on Japan, um, America signed a, the peace treaty with Japan in San Francisco, which is called the San Francisco Peace Treaty. And in that treaty, it was provided that that treaty ended all questions on all liabilities and claims against the Japanese government. And so, that is what the Japanese government relies on to this day, to deny legal responsibility and public acceptance for their actions during World War II. So, to end, you may ask me, why are you writing about this? Isn't writing a novel supposed to entertain instead of being this moralistic avenger? Yes, you are right. But true to my goals as a writer, I am now writing this historical, this historical novel because I believe that while our goals as creative writers is to entertain, we also have a solemn duty to inform and educate our readers about the society we live in. The trick for the good writer is to draw in our reader into the compelling path of our narrative while avoiding being preachy or moralistic. To treat our fictional characters like real human beings with human rights of their own, not to be judged until proven guilty, and if guilty, to be treated with dignity and compassion. With this, I'd like to end, if I may, with the working prologue to my upcoming novel, Gabriela's Eyes. I come from seven generations of cursed women, born of a love forbidden. Thus, while I yearn for an ordinary life, mine was destined for the extraordinary. When people ask me where I come from, I want to tell them, I come from a land so beautiful, they call it Pearl of the Orient Seas. Yet I know this is not what they seek, but the appeasement of their distrust for the unfamiliar. With long straight hair of ebony, skin neither dark nor fair, a nose hinting of patrician origins, yet not ascending enough where the bridge rests, and eyes that slant at the tips and whisper of Asian forebears, I am of both east and west, yet belonging to neither. Of all my features, however, it is the color of my eyes that has drawn the greatest curiosity, much like that of a freak of nature for it is the color of purple, a color that defies the laws of hereditary, heredity of my people, thus branding me an alien among them. It is said, I have the eyes of a grandmother, six generations before me. She came from a land across two great oceans, from a people who had gems for eyes. Lore has it that the color of her eyes was a mystery in itself. They called it ube, the color of a native yam, prized as a rare, sweet delicacy, fit for the gods, though dug from the earth.
was not of any single strand of purple. It ranged from the mystic depths of smoky amethyst to the brilliant violet of tanzanite, depending on how the light struck the irises. But this ancestor committed the gravest sin, they said, the sin of upsetting the natural order of things. And so her parent, parents curse her for it, a curse that was to plague succeeding generations of our women, to be lifted only by a certain sign, the appearance of a female descendant with the same purple eyes as our French foremother. Over time, this tragedy faded in our collective memory, just as our purple-eyed ancestor vanished like a ghost in our family's history, shrouded in legend and superstition, only reappearing to haunt us whenever a clanswoman had lost the love of her life. For that was our reminder that the curse was still upon us. And when I was born, my family rejoiced, for now they knew for sure that the stories about our purple-eyed foremother were true, as was the fulfillment of the prophecy of my birth, which was the salvation it would bring our women. Being the seventh daughter of the seventh generation, blessed with eyes of the fabled hue, I became the embodiment of hope and forgiveness in my clan. Yet there was a time when it seemed to me that I was burdened with a curse more vicious than what I had apparently lifted from the women of my family. It appeared as though the evil spell delivered its cruelest blow on the one who had proclaimed its leave. I myself became the curse incarnated.